So look, it's saying here, right, on that website, on that Visit Anglesey website, I read this quite a few, I read this a couple of years ago, maybe two years ago, it might be a bit longer. The central area of the main chamber contained the remains of a fire on which had been poured a stew, including ras, eel, frog, toad, grass snake, mouse, shrew and hare. I thought he had said snails, but um, for the French are well known for eating snails. Um, you know, and the French, <laughs> I think they, they probably ate snails as well, you know, because it, it's a French thing, and the French are the Gales, the Gales are the Celts, and the Celts were all over Europe, so I've, I've kind of just got a feeling that, that they did eat snails. The thing about this is, it's it's found in that chamber, so you've got a connection with the sort of people who were active in those chambers, or at least someone who went in there, Right? So, frog is a small animal. Toad's a small animal. Eels, it's like fish. Mouse, not easy to catch. Back then, quite difficult to catch now unless you've got a trap. Well, unless you, unless you might, he might have made a trap out of wood, you know, he might have made a little wooden cage, you don't know what he did. Uh, he might put some food in it to catch the mouse in a little trap. Grass snake, shrew hare. So, that's small animals. Now, the thing is this. I I was diabetic, and I have had to completely revolutionise my diet, right? And I've, you know, had to... I've tried every diet that you can think of. And I've, I've, I've calculated it mathematically. And I'm on to eating a diet now that is absolutely... If you got a graphic equaliser of nutrients, what is the... Because I'm, I'm really trying not to lose weight. I'm desperately trying to lose as much weight as I can. And I'm struggling now. Um, I've got a little bad... I've got some bad influences still. But the stuff that I am eating is the right stuff. And it's the right amount of stuff. And I, I can't lower the calories now any less with the amount of nutrients I'm getting. My nutrients are peaking the top of the graphic equaliser, right across the top of the vitamin and mineral spectrum. Everything is, like, on maximum for the least calories that I can get away with. And then the only reason I'm failing my diet is because I can't resist picking up other stuff that people leave around. So, and what that, di what that diet is, what I've worked it out at, is it is... A mixture of three different types of leaves, which is spinach leaves, nettle leaves, and broccoli, right? Which are all cruciferous. And the broccoli's got um, it's got quite a bit of sugar in broccoli, to be honest. Now the nettle has got very, very high amounts of calcium in it, a lot better than milk, because milk's actually the thing with milk is it's made for babies. If you if you're a druid and you're watching how nature works and you're making observational assessments of you know what you should be doing as well as a creature, you watch little lambs and you watch them drink milk and little baby animals drink milk and then they grow up and then they start eating grass. They don't drink milk anymore, right? So my observations teach me with intuition that. Animals drink milk when they're little, and then when they grow up, then they eat green leaves, right? That is an intellectual observation that I like to grant my ancestors of having that intellectual capacity in them to make those observations, right? Unfortunately, we don't anymore, and everyone drinks milk as if it's kind of water. And actually, the, the high levels of protein in milk, the same affects your calcium absorption and all this, and it's to do, there's a lot of messing up. You know, eating a lot of eggs can mess up your cholesterol production. There is a lot of nutrients in eggs, but it raises your cholesterol. Now, my diet at the moment, my spinach is peaking in the potassium, right? It's my 300 grams of spinach, right? I have about 300 grams of spinach made into a puree, and then I have 300 grams of nettle made into a puree, and I have 300 grams of broccoli made into a puree, and I mix it up, and then I put a little bit of spices in to give it some flavour, so it tastes a little bit like a curry, but you could make it with gravy or whatever. And that is about 400 calories, and that is... 
through the roof of calcium, through the roof of potassium, through the roof of magnesium, through the roof of B vitamins. It's got 30 grams of protein in. And when you mix it together, it, it's, it's a good protein. My fingernails are growing, you know, my fingernails aren't snapping or anything. They're growing decent, you know. They could be a little bit stronger, maybe a bit thicker, right? So, and that's all plant, leaf-based. Now, the only thing that I'm short of in that diet is my other 30 grams of protein. I've got 30 grams. I need another 30 grams of protein to make 60, right? Now, what could make... Without being greedy, without eating in excess, without all this feasting, feasting, feasting business, if I was a man of intellectual, spiritual study of observations of nature and animals and the astral movements of the planets and educating myself through observational intuition and reflection and meditation of the world around me, right? You know, and I can tell when I'm putting weight on, when I'm losing weight, I'm watching everything, I'm making observations and I'm adjusting things, right? Where would you get 30 grams of protein from? Right? Oh, let me guess. It's not that much, 30 grams of protein. You, know, you could catch a salmon or something like that. Let me guess. It just happens that, what coincidence, right? You know, a frog, a toad, a grass snake, a mouse and a shrew would equate, they're all small animals, but, it, you know, you're getting, you know, 30 grams of protein. Not that much more and not that much less. You know, frog, toad, a grass snake and a mouse. Right, and a bird, that's 30 grams of protein. They're small, but, you know, it, it's not killing your ass to, you know, to stop you, you know, getting to the zoo, is it? Do you know what I mean? So, I'd like to propose my proposal, and from the evidence in this, even the Neanderthals were eating a very mixed and varied diet of... It says they were, they were eating... Uh, uh, about a very healthy, balanced diet of 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 plants uh, and everything, right? They weren't just going to the pig market, getting you know as many pigs as they can, and as Mark Professor Mike, Mark Parker Pearson claims, feasting, gorging themselves on a massive feast orgy of. Cattle slaughter. You know the, the way that you know these Stonehenge archaeologists are painting the picture. They like you to believe, and some of the people at Newgrange, you know, are talking about feasting, feasting, feasting. If you look at these people who are speaking, who is the person speaking about feasting? Oh, a person who looks like they've just been to a feast, right? Who is the person who's telling you, you know, it's likely not feasting? Uh, me, a person who doesn't look like they've just been to a feast, a person who looks like they're eating very healthy and holding the ridge quite well because the skin's not all knackered. So, you know, my I say to Mark Parker Pearson, right, just because you found some cows being slaughtered and some people having meals and eating some cows and, oh, they were throwing the buns away and leaving meat on there, you know. Well, they weren't starving, probably because they'd been eating the, the vegetables, you know. Maybe that's why, you know. Um, who, who meticulously, you know, you know, meticulously stripping a cow out of every single piece of, um, the person who's stripping it ain't eating it. The person who's stripping the meat off, 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 off the animal ain't eating it, you know. He's probably on his food, you know. So, so they're going to cook it later, you know, stack it in some salt or whatever, you know. Just because I, I want to see evidence, right, I want Parker Pearson, you know, and Professor Alice, I want evidence of how many pork chops did they eat. When you can prove to me that he ate 18 pork chops, right, then I'll believe that they were all facing the faces off, right? Until then, we've got evidence of the people who were active in the chambers and they were eating... Um, 30 grams of protein, which is a couple of small animals. And, you know, if you don't eat leaves, if you don't eat leaves or berries, you get scurvy, right? Now, I don't think they were that stupid. It's clearly obvious to an educated man who can, you know, line up stones and organise people to move, you know, 50-ton stones that 
I'm watching what are these animals around me eating to stay alive and they're breathing, they've got nostrils, they're eating green stuff, you know, grass. In fact, that cow hasn't eaten one pig, one pork chop, one sheep, you know, uh, that, that bullock is very strong, very muscular, you know, his testosterone level, his male hormones are very strong and then all he's doing is eating plants and grass. So, A, observation dictates that a living, breathing, oxygen-breathing creature can sustain a very strong and healthy, muscular, toned body with virile hoof growth eating vegetation, right? I can make those observations, and I grant that to my ancestors. And, you know, if I was watch, watching myself and reflecting in, in, a, in a pond, in a pond water, oh, I'm putting a bit of weight on. I'm getting a bit fat. How does that happen? Well, you know, it's coming from somewhere. Where is that fat coming from? It's coming from things that I put in my mouth, my, my, in my mouth likely, you know. And I'm, I've got to catch these mice and chase these mice, and, and it's slowing me down a bit. So, you know, maybe I, I shouldn't be, you know, eating, eating all that. So, from my own experience in my own struggles and my own diet and my own calculations of what is the right thing to eat, from this perfect mix of leaf diet that I have found, which is a, a nice mix of three different types of leaves, like my, my nettles, my broccoli, and my spinach, which is absolute, gives you the, the you can't beat it, it can't be beaten, you, you can't beat that mix of leaves for nutritional value, it can't be beaten for, for, for the calories, because, you know, if you start eating turnips, potatoes, stuff like that, then you start getting excess calories to, to what you really want to have right so you, you get the the you know and then you've got nuts for oils proteins and that but if you, you're getting oils if you start eating animals and then you've got salmon salmon's got oils in it but this is the other thing i'm having a talk with a guy in in one of the other groups in the doggerland group right and we're talking about um eye color and and, and, and things like that they didn't know exactly that when you eat fish, it gives you vitamin A in its direct form, right? And and if you eat too much of it, it, it can be toxic to your system, you know? If you eat too way too much vitamin A, we normally get as vitamin A converted from green vegetables, and that's plenty enough. But when you start eating it on fish, you're getting it direct, and you stop converting it, right? My... I strongly believe that, and this is my observational, you know, if you want to, you can get some scientists to go look into it, but I don't need scientists to go into it because I just know. I know it through intuition. And the intuition is that I believe, you know, a certain people have acquired a certain appearance and a certain look um, from eating a lot of fish and living on the sea coast and borders of the countries, on, on the coastal areas and, and at sea. Uh, and and I I believe that it, it's it's the look that what Daniel Craig's got, and it, in the latest James Bond film, Daniel Craig he walks up and he's carrying two fish and he chucks them on the floor, right? And I've kind of got that sort of shaped face as well. People have got that kind of shape about them, and they don't necessarily always have blue eyes. They might have green eyes or, or possibly even brown. But it, it's this sort of it is kind of like a, a kind of I would call it an amphibious sort of kind of feature to their eyes it's the, if, you, if you want to know what I mean it's the Daniel Craig look so I kind of believe that certain people who lived and ate a, a lot of fish you know gradually how were uh, getting a lot of vitamin A but they wouldn't have known it were toxic or not toxic you know unless you just drop down dead straight away when you eat one but I believe that persistent eating of this vitamin A high, super high fish oils and vitamin A diet, you know, fermented cod liver, fermented cod liver oil and that, has um, created a certain look of people's. Now, you know, I ain't got any evidence to back it up, but I, 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 I'm I, willing to stake, you know, um, a bet that I, I think it is because I, I just find, you know, I, it makes sense to me because vitamin A really affects the eyes and what is the main thing you would get a lot of vitamin A from is if you ate a lot of fish and fish oils so to me they, they kind of play on that theme in stingray in the in 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 the stingray um program they've got characters in that 
TV show, Stingray, that, that have kind of playing on that, you know, living under the ocean and that. So I think that it, it's a theory that's out there. People might not necessarily talk about it, but I think people have thought about it before. Maybe nobody's given a, a, a talk on it like this, but I think it's it's something that, that people might intuitively have pondered, you know, and, and put plausible. So, you know, that's one thing. And then you've got all the other things that could affect people's appearance, you know, like, you know, different plants, flowers, you know... Um, Dennis McKenna saying, you know, certain mushrooms have got certain evolutionary effects, you know, because they've played a role in evolution affecting either the GABA system or the serotonin system, you know, or, you know, um, various different plants, you know, different peoples, you know. So, you know, there are, expe- there are tests going on, you know, they're doing, they're doing work in the Imperial College in London on psilocybin. If you want to get the uh, results, then, you know, go ask him. Is he doing the right experiments and tests, you know, to look into evolution or not? You know, if it's... How, how does De- Dennis McKenna say it? It modulates the... It modulates the consciousness so you get a stronger flow into one hemisphere and, uh, and it, 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 it's kind of like brain hemisphere acupuncture, you know. Maybe you get more into the, you know, um, periental lobe for imagination or then different plants put more into the frontal lobe, you know, for concentration on language. This is why you get certain different people have got racial abilities, you know. And, and, and over hundreds of thousands of years, you know, when, when they're and dieting on certain plants, they, they become specialists, you know. Some people, this is why, you know, you, you, there's not really one person who's the best because you know it, it, it's about modulation there are, you know you get people who are really good for running who are really tall like you know Usain Bolt you know he, he's got the physique for it you know and then you get some people who are really good with imagination but they might not be as good with language or concentration there are always it's like having a car you've got a Land Rover which is good for going off road right but it's not going to win a Formula 1 race and you've got racing cars that can go really fast but if you go off road they get stuck you know can you you know maybe it's possible to have a vehicle that's good at everything but the thing about human consciousness is usually when you're concentrating on one thing you know it, 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 you'd have you you have to be um what's the, you'd have to have this um, what's it called this um multitasking skills which is but but usually you perform better when you're concentrating on what you're doing although there are certain functions you can perform subconsciously where you're not even thinking about it you know like you can go off into a daydream and end up, you know, walking, you know, 10 mile and, you, oh, and then you wake up from the daydream and you think, oh, I walked here perfectly well and safely, you know, stuff like that. So, you know, this is what the druids were studying. I think this is very reflective and contemplative over their own consciousnesses. And when, when you when you can only find one certain type of food, you know, it, 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 it puts you into a certain consciousness in a way. And then if you're changing over from a season to another type of food, you might kind of think, oh, no, my memory's got not as good at the moment. I'm sure I'm better at remembering things. And no, I'm not. And you know, you think, oh, I'm eating this now and not that. You know, this is, that is, you're getting into studying, you know, the Druid culture when you get into that. That's what it's about. I, I kind of get... Um, sometimes, you know, I get a bit upset when there's people going, where's, where are your facts? Where are your facts? Where are your experiments? Life's not always about modern facts and experiments, you know. And at the end of the day, what is a guy digging something up and then, you know, saying, oh, well, you know, and te- you know what what are his methods? What, what is his evidence? I found this object and I did a, I performed a chemical analysis of it and the, the, the results of the chemical analysis come out with a chemical reaction that, that, that suggests that it, has been in the ground for this long um you know but so what it might have been in the ground for that long you know but then again you know we might have been out of the ground for for longer before it was put in the ground for that long you know or it might have been contaminated with some other material that, that had been in the ground for a different amount of time that that, that, that was on it you know it, it's like Sherlock Holmes there's always another another mystery that's the thing with archaeologists you know um it, they get enough evidence so they can make a, you know, a certain statement. And we were going to school 10 years ago and they were teaching us things in schools that they were absolutely convinced of. And now they're saying, oh, no, we've, we've disproved that. We've found something else. So, 
you know, there's always a new theory and an always a new new teaching and always a new science. So you know, you can you can say my theory or my proposals useless or rubbish. But it's certainly as useless as rubbish as the ones that people were getting degrees for and being acclaimed as professors 10 years ago that are now being disproved and are not, not true. So, you know, who, who's the fool at the end of the day, you know? I, I think that this, these people in these chambers who were eating these things, I don't think that they were eating excessively and, and, and doing these feasts I actually think that humans do have a tendency to get greedy when food becomes um, plentiful, but we were doing a lot more exercise back then than we are now. And I think that the Druids, there's this seam through religion, This there's this thread going back through religions of this, this fasting, fasting. And, and I think that the Druids, you know, understood balance and harmony and i think they tried to teach that to other people you know and that that's what it's about you know that's what the origins of religion is about sharing you know splitting the fish you know sharing with each other that is the origin of religious roots you know and when you lose that religion and get into a consumer world like we are now it's all about money and profit you know and it's all about excess and greed and this is when you get all these imbalances you know and and this is why a lot of people like um, the ancient cultures and the ancient knowledge, um, and, and they try want to try and revive it because there are a lot of spiritual balances that they feel that we're losing, you know. And I think this is evidence. I think that evidence. I think this, th those animals that he's eating are very small animals, and they, 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 it's about right for what I think that should be eaten, which is you know. Think should be in about just under a kilogram of um, you know mix of leaves and herbs, um, which you get your potassium, calcium, and magnesium from, and your vitamin C, and vitamin A, and B vitamins, and then you get your B12 from being in contact with the earth, um, which we were a lot more in contact with the earth back then, um, and um, you know you get your 30 grams of protein from a, a little bit of you know, animals and meat, and and if you don't have to kill your um, horse that you're riding around on, then then you're all right, you know. But if you do end up killing your horse, then you're not going to be getting anywhere fast, are you? Um, you know. So that's why I think. That's my opinion. I really strongly believe this opinion. I really, really, really believe this opinion. Um, and I I don't think I think there are there is there are uh, there's a group of people in archaeology who really like the food foodies, the foodies and. You've got to be a psychologist. You've got to be a modern psychologist to understand people and behaviour to... When somebody's standing in front of you uh, and giving you a presentation, yes, they're giving you facts. Yes, they're giving you archaeological empirical evidence that they've investigated. But who is the person speaking? What are their own personal bias and their own goals? Are they also wanting to um, try and justify their own existence and their own, you know, love of food um, by trying to prove the ancestors' love of excess food, you know, because they've got a, a love of excess food. This is the problem, you know, and I strongly believe that that, that that figures into it, and this is why Druids studied a holistic subject. If you watch um, Gail Higginbottom... Gail Higginbottom absolutely totally agrees with that. And in fact, I have listened to her and I've like, wow, Gail, you've just blown my mind. Um, Dr. Gail H Higginbottom, uh, I've just listened to you speak in that video on megalophomania and it's, uh, it's brilliant. What a brilliant presentation. I completely agree with you. She She's saying all the things that I totally think myself, totally on my wavelength, you know, it's like a holistic study of all subjects, Got psychology elements, you know, science elements, nature study elements, you know, astronomy, stargazing. These people, it was a world subject, all things. And now we've got these specialists in archaeology, then we've got mathematicians, and we've got astronomers, and they're all doing this separate field. And sometimes they lose sight of the self and their own objectives and motives and their own strengths and weaknesses and biases in, them, in themselves uh, in what they're pursuing. Uh, and unfortunately, also, a lot of the archaeologists affiliated with sponsors, government agencies, Department of, you know, um, food, 
Uh, and they, they, the last thing they want to do is, you know, um, they don't want to stop selling things because, you know, they need to be making revenue and things like that. So they're going to try and push it, this feasting thing, and I'm going to oppose it. I strongly oppose this feasting theory. And, and if, if there were anyone feasting, there were people around who were trying to stop them from doing it because it, it's not good. And that's what the Archbishop of Canterbury is supposed to be doing now, but but he's trying to divert attention away to our charities, charities, Africa, poor people, when we've got a serious problem with obesity and overeating in this country, you know, and it can't be ignored. Uh, and when you, you need to understand these people who lived in these chambers, who ate in these chambers, the, the heritage of our spiritual ancestors that ended up being replaced by the Christian faith, we want to know what they were eating. We need to know what their balanced diet is. And the evidence suggests that these people were eating the correct amount of food, not excess. They were eating small animals, which just it, it, it nicely makes up your protein requirements in addition to your, um, you know, your, your vegetable nutritional requirement from your vegetables, which you, you need vitamin C or you're going to get scurvy anyway, you know? I'm not saying they knew what scurvy was or, you know, in the sense of a modern doctor, but they will have known that, you know, we have to eat this green stuff that's growing out because other animals are eating it and then that's how they've got healthy, you know, nail bits and, 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 and muscles and stuff like that, you know? It's just... It, only a fool would deny that, you know? So, you know, that that that's what I think... Um, you know, that's my opinion. You'd have to agree with me or not. And I think that this supports it. I actually think that Gail Higginbottom supports it as well in, in the presentation that she gave to Megalithomania as well. And I think Howard Crowers would agree with me as well, you know. So I'm strongly opposed to all these people who are... It's mainly the Stonehenge movement. These people behind Stonehenge and these big highways and tunnels under the motorway, it's all .gov. The .gov crew are desperate to... They've got to prove that they've got to support this excess lifestyle pitch um, to keep funding their highways and tunnels and motorways and new visitors' museums and all this and to fund these archaeological projects. Unfortunately, you know, the real actual spiritual ancestors would not be pushing that. They'd be pushing eat healthy, don't eat excess, grow your own food, don't buy it. You know, and that's not good for HM government. So, HM government affiliated uh, archaeologists are not going to be pushing this because it does. It's not financially. Um, it, it's not. Um, it, it, it's not in their interests to, unfortunately, and that is the problem with the world at the moment. And you know, I'm. A, I'd like to think that my ancestors know that you know they they you know we're still here. And, you know, we're, this is the job that we've got, is to make sure that the human race is healthy and stays fit and, you know, at optimal efficiency and, and does not get um, um, harmed by all these breads, harmful breads that were being made, like, you know, Dr. Eckberg um, and Dr. Um, Eric Berg on YouTube are telling us now with actual empirical scientific evidence that these breads that they've modified are actually killing us and destroying his metabolism, you know? that That's the job of our ancestors today, you know? We are them, and we need to we need to look in these chambers to, to you know, that validates who, who we are uh, and what we are uh, and what we believe in and what we're doing not feasting his faces full of pork chops, you know? Th these people in this chamber were not feasting the face full of pork chops, I can tell you that now.